of you people who follow Christ and Christ alone, well, also the Father and the Holy Spirit, full of Christ. This is Pastor Sean Stuckey. Welcome to the podcast. Everybody, thank you for tuning in to Death Church Radio or Death Church Podcast. And uh, we got a good one for you tonight. It's like uh, Steve Hart with Family Feud. i got a good one for you this week. And I um, just want to talk about a couple of things that actually happened uh, about an hour or so ago. Uh, I'm talking about a lot of things that have to do with demonology. I'm also watching an episode of Ghost of Enter Adventures on the Travel Network. And I haven't watched this show for uh, quite a while. I don't um, normally watch shows of... Um, like, like spiritual shows like this, like on Travel Network and Destination America, there's a lot of them. My dad, well actually both my parents are really into that stuff, they're really into those shows, but uh, I felt a little while ago, maybe maybe a couple years ago, that I felt that God was telling me to quit watching those shows at the time, because I was getting way too, obs- I was way too obsessive with those when I was in high school. Um, when I was in high school, other than, being, other than wanting to be a professional wrestler, I wanted to be a professional paranormal investigator, and... So, you know, to stop doing that, you know, recently it actually had come back up because of an altercation that I got in with my boss. <clears throat> Unfortunately, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not going to be naming his name, but at the previous job that I was working for for the first half of this year, um, I had a, uh, quite a few problems with the boss that came in after the original boss I had at the grocery store I worked at, and it was so intense, this, the altercation was so intense that I actually highly, I didn't do it, but I highly, highly considered going in, um, back in on my word of not doing any types of spells or magic or ritualistic activity, you know, pretty much anything. And, um, you know, it's kind of a thing where... <clears throat> I kind of made a promise to myself years ago that I would never do it again, because I've been safe for now seven years now, and I told myself I was never going to do that type of stuff ever again. So, it, um, you know, it did come up. I was actually writing out a spell and things like that to greatly, greatly hurt and curse uh, my previous employer. So, I did not do it. I let it go. It did not come to pass. And, uh, very glad that I went and went ahead and dropped that. I repented for it. I still haven't ripped up the paper. The paper that I wrote the spell on for instructions is actually... I was not able to buy in the stuff at the time because I'm still out of a job until the 19th of next month, which I started the Red Cross. I'm a supplicant. Anyways, but I'm not going to be doing it because it's not of Christ. It's not right. I should just forgive him and just move on with my life. I'm just... I'm a very... Uh, as a man, 28-year-old man... I've always been a very sensitive person. I have a big heart, but I get hurt easily. So it's very difficult for me to have long sustaining relationships with people that are not pers- very personal family members and my friend Rob. Like, he's the only one that I can think of that's been gone over at least three years of a consistent basis for a friendship that's not a family member. So um, it's just because of who I am. I have a lot of, I have a lot of hang-ups and whatnot, but anyways, we're talking about uh, demonology with this woman. I'm not going to announce her name or the name of the mentor, the name of the mentor mentee. Uh, but basically, we're talking about demonology. And I said, hey, I thought, well, I want to do a 15-minute segment, a 10 to 15-minute segment for uh, the Death Church Radio podcast uh, before we get into the, the importance of discipleship part two. Where I'm going to read three chapters, and we're going to break that down. I thought, well, you know, let's talk about demonology. Hardly anybody ever in Tucson that I'm aware of for the last six years hardly talk about it. I'm actually not exactly sure how it works with Phoenix. Phoenix has a higher um, percentage number. I'm, I'm aware that they have a... I'm somewhat aware that they have a higher percentage number when it comes to, like, legitimate Christians that go to sun, go to Sunday church at least once a month. Um, because I know in Tucson, it, it's like a number like 1.4% of Tucson's population. Which is strange, I was talking about this on a show on the 1C2 our podcast, that it's really strange because there's a church like on every street corner. So it's like, well, how could that be? And then I did more research and found out, oh, okay, it's not talking about Catholicism, it's not talking about Mormonism, and the different other sects like, um, like Science Church and things like that. Um, it's only talking about non-denominational, truly legitimate 
Christian followers of Jesus, like those types of people. It's like 1%. And technically, Tucson is still, at this point, an untouched region. So, uh, and I believe a lot of that has to do with demonic activity. It has a lot to do with Satan. I, I, I highly believe that. And, I mean, it is up for interpretation. I mean, if you want to come on the show by, and talk about that, you know, if you feel that uh, you want to disagree with me and think, well, Sean, I think you're just stretching a little bit there. Uh, come on the show, just uh, type in Stooky Shop People College at Yahoo.com, all lowercase. Uh, just shoot me an email or go on my Facebook at, at uh, Sean C, capital C, Stooky. Um, go ahead and add me on Facebook because that's like my fan page, sort of, because uh, I'm also a writer. That's my fan page. Uh, just go ahead and do that and email me or whatever and say if you want to come on the show, we'll discuss it for a segment. Um, so, I'll talk about demonology for a little bit. Um, I do believe that I was called to do things like this. It's been apparent. It's been apparent for a really long, even when I was a little kid, it's a really long time. Like a guy, Ryan Buell, uh, from Paranormal State. I think that's what that show's called. I used to watch that show, like, I think it was like on a &E or something, or AMC, something like, something like that, or Destination America, something like that. I used to watch that, like, all the time when I was in high school. I told my dad about it. He bought all the DVDs. He still currently owns them all, and he thinks that's his favorite show, other than... Mountain monsters, or something where they keep chasing after Bigfoot, but you find out um, when uh, Bigfoot's throwing rocks at them, it's probably the cameraman throwing them and it's hitting those uh, hicks on the head and stuff like that. It's a really ridiculous show, but it's really entertaining. Uh, well, I'm not talking about that, I'm talking about actual paranormal shows. And so I was into that, and, I've been, and just like him, you know, he had a lot of demonic presence even when he was a child, and a lot of, a lot of kids do. For some reason, the veil is just very light when it comes to kids and interacting with spirits. So I don't, I, even with all the research I've done, I consider myself a demonologist. That's my specialty as a pastor. I still don't really understand that, but as to why that's true, or certain people, like with a sixth sense type of thing, or, I mean, because now a scientist came out saying there's more than six senses, like nine senses, but... Um, anyways, like a sixth sense of a thing where you can, um, you know, it's like people can uh, be affected by other people's auras, like the energy they're putting out. Like if, like my friend was saying uh, earlier today in the group chat that I'm in, that she was having an okay time at her job, and then this guy came in at her job, an elder, uh, an elder man, and he had, she was just like in a really bad mood. I think she was picking up on it or something like that, and it just ruined her mood. People are sensitive to auras and also uh, electricity currents and, what you know, things like that, whatnot. So, I mean, you know, it's a thing where, um, it's, uh, that, so that's, that's what I'm, uh, talking about. And, and certain people are just sensitive to those things. And then sometimes there's very extreme cases, um, where the demonic activity gets really, really crazy. I know I already did this in a testimonial video before, but if you all just, you know, lightly touch on it, you know, for the segment, um, for my own testimony, I mean, I just, uh, I, uh, I mean, the situations I was in were very frightening uh, back when I was in my late teens, early 20s. Pretty sure I was around 17 or 18. I was heavily addicted to screwing around and making my own Ouija boards, like out of paper and stuff, and I do it in front of my friends. And two of my friends from high school, that were, we were all three of us were devout Satanists at the time, heavily believed in Satan, hated God, hated anything to do with God, hated Catholicism, and I didn't really hate Mormonism all that much. I thought they were okay. But the thing that just hated me, the, the thing that I hated the most, it was just this underlying thing that just came out of me, of this just really negative energy that was from inside of me, was when I would talk to or hear about legitimate Christians with, you know, really good vessels. They're repented up. Um, they're weaponed up, you know, the sheep are weaponed up and things like that. And they're really just genuinely good people, honestly, walking with the Lord, have the eyes on the cross. And those types of Christians, they drove me nuts. Like, I hated them. I literally would just think all day sometimes about brutally murdering people like that. Back when I was a teenager. I mean, I'm 28 right now, and it's been a long time. Really messed up. Th you know, I came from a really bad, really bad past. But... <laughs> I'd screw around and make my own Ouija boards like I was just saying and things like that. I would um, get uh, books of magic with my dad because my dad was the one who told me about the 
Lesser Key of Solomon, um, Celtic magic books. He would tell me about the books of uh, Wiccan cultures and things like that, and spell books, spellbinding, spellbinding books of all the different types of spells that you can do or have someone do to you if you pay for it. You know, the the star, the right side up star that's green. So, uh, I mean, I wasn't all that stuff, but my especially my favorite was Anton LaVey's uh, Church of Satanism. Uh, that's the one that I followed the most, and that's the one that I heavily wanted to be a part of at the time. Actually, before I got saved in mid-2009, it was June, me and my friend at the time were actually planning on taking the bar train all the way to San Francisco because we were going to attend a Sunday service at Anton LaVey's Church of Satanism because we lived, uh, the bar train only took like 20 minutes from where we were at in Hayward, or 20 or 30 minutes, something like that, to get there, and we were going to do that, but I got saved, and me and him kind of quit talking. But um, anyways, and at the time it was very intense. Uh, I was even speaking with my mom about 20, 30 minutes ago, and she's very nervous about the fact that this uh, the woman that I was talking to, a deacon at the church, was saying she wants me to come to the church that I used to go to two years ago in Tucson and meet her, you know, just kind of just get back into the flow of things of going back to church. I just got invited to a new men's group uh, by Jake. His name's Jake, and uh, it's at the Chipotle I used to go to downstream from my parents' house. And so these things are kind of just popping up, and it's really nice. But at the same time, it's like it's something I really have to pray on and think of. Because I, I kind of always thought that I was going to be the Ed Warren of Tucson, and Nancy was going to be the Lorraine Warren of Tucson. But, you know, it's, um, it, it's <laughs> this job is not for the faint of heart. It's The job is very frightening. So... I, the last time I dealt with really hardcore demonic activity was last October, and I'm st I feel like in on August 22nd right now that I'm just not I'm still not ready, like because of the situation of everything that was happening when I wrote out the uh, awakening number four prayer that was, that's on my channel that I released over about a year ago or so, uh, praying for all the city of Tucson and hitting all the points of the outside of Tucson that goes to all the freeways and inside all Tucson. Of all the one million inhabitants, I pray that the Holy Spirit would go to each, each and every single person. I want to see uh, the Great Commission uh, before my eyes. I want to see a great awakening by all one over one million people, women, children, babies, kids, uh, grandparents, whatever, from, from all walks of life, all see Jesus and accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. You know, to become saved and all of Tucson would just be alive, but... Man, I did that prayer. I played it for 24 hours, four days straight, and my thing was I was just gonna I was gonna play it for 30 days because I felt that was gonna be enough time for the awakening to happen. <clears throat> and I was also praying myself. I wrote out the prayer and I prayed for 15 minutes, and it just 15 minutes kept going on for 24 hours. I kept playing it on repeat. And on the fourth day, oh man, oh man, did uh, <clears throat> did my life hit the fan because. It, uh, things got pretty intense. Uh, we're talking bad luck left and right, I, like to the point where it was inescapable. Think like I, uh, horrible things were happening, horrible things, and it just kept going on and on. And I just stopped the prayer. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I was telling Jesus, just take it all from me. As long as I'm living for you, and all these people get saved, you can take whatever you want from me. And uh, you know, with you, Jesus, I'll be able to get through this. Sorry about that. I'll be able to get through this, Jesus. But oh, jeez, man, when when it, when those things were actually happening, it was really difficult. And I was also still nursing a wound from at the time when one of my old friends that I got became really close to about a year or two years ago. He actually, you know, stabbed me in the back, and it it's happened a lot in the church. I, I've been to about seven different churches, um, maybe eight. I'm not exactly sure. Plus things online, plus men's groups and Bible studies and whatnot, and it's kind of just a thing that happens over and over again with God's people. I keep getting stabbed in the back, or they keep doing things that make me really upset with them, and every time we get in an altercation or try to talk things through, it just doesn't work out, and we go our separate ways. And then I say, well, just screw the whole thing. Uh, God, forget it. I'm not going to church. I'm not dealing with your, because your followers suck. I'm tired of them. That's how I felt. That's how I feel a lot of the time, even though I don't. I know that's not true because there's a lot of people that are genuinely good Christians and, you know, everybody, nobody's infallible. Only Jesus is the one that's infallible. So, it's, you know, it's, it's a growing thing for me. 
But anyways, talked a little bit about that in my testimony for the first part of the segment and a little bit about demonology and scary things like that. And I'll probably do another one uh, next week <coughs> for the opening of the show. So go ahead and sit tight. <coughs> Turn on your game system. you got a PS3. you got a Super Nintendo. you got a Sega Genesis, my favorite system, whatever it is. Go ahead and put it on right now. As you're listening to this podcast, go ahead and put this on on your arm sleeve at the gym. If you're running on a treadmill or lifting weights, or if you just do what I do and just go hiking at different places, you know, thank the Lord it's finally cooling down. So go ahead and, if you're hiking, go ahead and put this on, whatever you're doing. Put this on and take in your daily dose of Jesus. I started in a small town in the East Bay. Became saved in mid-2009. And now living out the Great Commission on Death Church Radio. And now here's me, Pastor Sean, with your daily dose of Jesus. Yeah, I'm going to be doing a combo commercial here. I'm going to be promoting two different bands or two different projects. One of them is going to be called Dirty Dice with AJ Gonzalez, also known as Al Fal or Al Gonzalez. Uh, what this man brings to the table is uh, the type of swing rockabilly music that anyone can have you playing at their bars or at the pool clubs on Saturday night. And Ross is in the band, Al and the other guy. And for this band, you're really going to want to go check them out, give them a call, find them on Facebook at Dirty Dice with the skeleton man wearing the leather jacket with the green mist coming out of his eyes. Check out that band for Rockabilly if you're really into that stuff and hire them. And for the next commercial, really quick, I want you to get, it's in production right now, it's called Other Half of Joust or Other Half of Joust Central, which is a power noise punk band with Christian inspired lyrics. So if you want to hear some punk music that's indecipherable and you have to read the lyrics because you don't know what the heck I'm saying, then go ahead and listen to the CD when it drops in about a month on YouTube. Hey everybody and welcome back once again to Death Church Podcast with your host Pastor Sean. That's me. I was actually uh, sitting down right now to write out a prayer for uh, the friend that I was actually speaking about in the first 15 minutes, that first segment of the show. I'm not going to be revealing his name, but uh, he's actually been on He's been on my mind lately. I uh, haven't seen him in probably about a year. May, yeah, somewhere about a year. There's this guy that I used to go to the uh, college group with. The college group actually was a... Not, not college group, but a pastoral training program. And uh, this guy... Uh, who was my friend where we would go out and hike on, I believe, Tuesdays and Wednesday nights. I think it was mostly Wednesday nights. Um, you know, unfortunately got in an altercation with a guy. He kind of left church. I don't know what happened to him. I haven't talked to him about a year. I don't know what's going on. I just hear that people are telling me he's in a bad place, quote-unquote. So I'm going to be actually praying for the man. I'm going to write out a three-page prayer for the guy, two- or three-page prayer. Uh, with a lot of uh, Bible verses that have to do with healing and whatnot, and really just going to bring it in front of the throne of God, bring it to Jesus, and ask Him, please bring it back, and please bring it back to the church. I mean, I've been going back to the church because my friend Jake, who is the manager at the uh, Big Heart Cafe here in Tucson off of Craycroft, he invited me to go to Chipotle, uh, down, all the way down to Chipotle, to join this new men's group. Uh, they're going to be talking about the kings and the rulers of Israel, and I said, man, that's right up my alley. If it's complicated and deep, I'm down. You don't got to, that, that's what I need in order to come to these college groups or Bible studies or whatever. If it's really complicated and really deep and spiritual and all, all those kind of things where I have to really think hard, then that's my group, baby. So anyways, I'm going to be writing out this prayer. I'll probably call it the 909 slash one sheep prayer because it's going to be specifically for him. And I'm going to play for 24 hours straight for three days and just you know just see what happens see if i'd be able to uh, run into my old friend again once i start going back to that church on uh sunday uh that's down the street from my parents house but uh what's been going on this week before we get into the segment where i read the three chapters and you can get your daily dose of jesus on discipleship by pastor dever um that guy's got a big following on twitter i wasn't aware until a couple days ago anyways i came back from phoenix yesterday uh just cleaned the house with my mom um, she's gotten, uh, she was just giving me crap, her and my brother, when she came over, and I was getting annoyed. Anyways, went shopping, did all the basic things, and then deep cleaned the apartment for about an hour, and then she left. I got my clothes from her house, uh, as I do my laundry over there. 
and because uh, I can't just I'm not able to use the dryers here at the complex that I live at because every time I put it in for an hour for the clothes even though it's not that much where the thing's gonna bust open because there's too much clothes in it it's always damp like it does the the system in there doesn't work or the washers and dryers and it's I don't know it got kind of frustrating so you know, of having damp clothes, so I just uh, started bringing it over to my parents' house because they have two brand new washer and dryers. Anyways, came back from Phoenix, hung out with a couple couple of days for my girlfriend, uh, Nancy, who I was talking about at the beginning of the podcast, the Lorraine Warren of Tucson. And I just came back, spent a couple of days there, watched the movie Maze Runner, and got canes, and I wrote a little bit for a story of a book that I'm just... Actually, I'm supposed to be working on the book tonight. Um, it's going to be, so far... It's going to be three poems, four short stories, an introduction, like a foreword, and, and, and an ending with a new picture. That's going to be my fourth book. It's a 45-page chat book. So that's what's going on in my life right now for this week. Um, I actually talked to my friend Brian. Uh, he's in Detroit right now, part of the missionary service called YWAM International. you got to save up. Uh, I, I don't know how many thousands of dollars he had to save up for to go to that thing, but he's going to be there for two years. And he was talking about that him and the other people in the program are taking a really, really bad ghetto parts in Detroit, you know, the dead motor city, um, to do gardening work, to um, kind of uh, give a sense of transformation, I guess. I'm assuming that's why they're doing it. He didn't really explain it that much. Uh, but they take him to bad parts of the neighborhood, kind of what, like, pretty much what this Shane Claiborne does in Philadelphia uh, with his green church. And they, uh, and he said he was doing a lot of yard work and gardening things along with the guys to make, make the society that they live in over there just really nice and make it look better, like give hope to the citizens of Detroit, which um, I, I don't know if it's like Tucson, but I'm sure it's worse. I've never been to Detroit. I know that their economy went bankrupt a couple years ago, and it's, you know, like 40% of all the streetlights don't work there. It's a, I read it in some article. Anyways, he's doing a lot of great things over there. And he shot me a call this morning. That was pretty cool. Um, he uh, called me at 11. I asked him to call me at 11 on Monday after I actually made the first segment on here because I wanted to speak to him about if God is calling me to go into works of removing demonic possession, oppression, and doing house cleanings. And a house cleaning, for the people who don't know, is when uh, you take your, it's when you or people come with you, Christians come with you as a prayer group, and you walk through someone's apartment or house reading the Psalms or declaring in the name of Jesus that every demonic being, every, you know, soldier of Satan is removed and thrown into the abyss. And you do that inside people's houses, and it's called cleaning. So, um, and we were talking about that earlier. It's a very, it's a very stressful situation for me, even though um, it's a thing where I feel I'm supposed to do it, but I don't. I don't know. I've actually talked to God earlier when I was going into the front, right before I was going to go into the fries, getting out of my mom's uh, SUV thing. And I was asking God, like, just show me what you want me to do. Just show me. Um, if you want me to do this, just lead me to it. it if this is what you want me to do, because I'm not sure. I mean, I don't want right right now as a pastor coming back to the church and everything as a pastor and teaching you guys for this you know bible study videos you know i got 10 fans it's you know it's like a regular bible study anyways um it's a thing where i don't know if i want to take responsibility for something like this in this specific situation uh when it comes to demonology like i'll help you out by giving you resources of books that i've read or know about including videos like where I was telling the woman I was talking to um, where she doesn't know what to do with her mentor or the, actually the person she's mentoring, sorry. Um, that has to do with uh, former Satanism, former Wiccan practice, things like that. A couple of exorcisms were performed on this girl and they didn't take. Um, so she was asking for resources, the best resource on those things to really get a good, the best that I could find personally to really get a good um, line on that of uh, knowledge would be from Doug Perry from Fellowship of the Martyrs dot com or FOTM one. He has a whole series of demonology videos. Did about three or four years ago, so or five years ago, something like that. I would, I mean, I told her, you know, I highly suggest you watch these videos. Go look this guy up. But anyways, he was telling me that you know I have to be careful because, in his opinion, he doesn't want to get around people like that that are way too spiritual and 
where he feels that some Christian people are way, way too compassionate and have too much of a fire and a passion for doing things like that. And he gave me a story where he's telling me that he knew this uh, woman or this girl that went to the church service. And she said this older um, woman, this elder, came up to her in the church and said, you got a spirit of something. Uh, like a, you got a type of bad spirit on you. There's the demon of something and it's on you and we need to get it off. And she just, you know, kind of walked in the church building not expecting it. And he felt, Brian felt, you know, through his discernment and the sermon of somebody else that there was nothing on her. They just, the woman came up to her and was like, we got to pray. And her and a bunch of people were laying hands on her during the Sunday morning service, which I'm sure was incredibly stressful. And with that type of situation, I feel that is completely inappropriate for me. I did used to watch those videos where those pastors in like um, uh, Nigeria were um, laying hands on people after the service where he would, well not after the service, but after the pastor would speak on the microphone and then he would go through the audience and he would say, you know, in the name of Jesus, he put his hand on the people's foreheads and stuff and then they would just collapse all over the floor and then one person would start freaking out, start screaming because they were possessed, I think. I mean, it's probably what it was, but I feel with this type of situation, it's highly inappropriate because the woman came out, or the girl, Brian's friend came out of the church screaming and she was crying is what he told me. And it's just, you know, it's very, it can become a very stressful situation, especially if you get a thought in your head when you see someone at church and you think, and then it's like your intuition's telling you, oh, that person, I see that one over there. She's possessed by the spirit of suicide. We have to get it off her. That one's infected with the spirit of greed. Things like that. And then they all just bum rush that person. I feel that's the equivalence of when those Toronto guys from part of the Toronto Blessing, you know, that BS. They were, It's kind of like on the same level playing field of you walking into the church and a bunch of people are just screaming their heads off. People say, in the name of Jesus, he hit him in the forehead. And some people feel like they're on fire fire and they're rolling around the ground they start barking like dogs or they just collapse on the ground and laugh hysterically that's that's kind of like around the same thing of what i feel is like it, it's like like i get that the person is really on fire for jesus when people do that and they don't have bad intentions they just honestly want to help the person and rid the demon which is understandable but i mean that's not how i would ever do it i used to think that's how you were supposed to do it years ago but you know, not anymore. So that that was one of his concerns, and he and Brian was talking about what we were discussing for like a half hour also of just the problem with a lot of Christians really, really put an emphasis on the spiritual things of uh, you know demonology, um, angelology of the angels and whatnot, and things that are super spiritual of supernatural healings, like basically like you know that show Supernatural with Sid Roth. You know, it's. And the church that I came out of that I found out was a cult with Pastor Pete Cabrera and all those old videos. That's actually the video I had the most views on on my channel. It's like at 4,000 something views, but I couldn't do it anymore because so many people sent me so many horrible, uh, very negative, very angry messages um, threatening me and whatnot. Anyways, so if it's a thing where it's, um, he said he tries to stay away from those things and he keeps in the meekness of Lord. If the Lord's going to tell him he's going to do it. And also abiding completely by scripture of God's scripture in the Bible, which is what I do too. The person needs to be theologically sound instead of running after miracles and seeing the uh, people get raised from the dead. And like, that's, that can't be your everyday experience. So, you know, that's just my, that's my opinion though. If you feel differently, go ahead and come on the show and we'll discuss it. You know, I left all that stuff in the description, description down low. So also the Tumblr page on Blue Divine. Forgot to, you know, um, Eon Blue Apocalypse letters. I've had a Tumblr for like the last four years. I haven't used it in about six months just because of all the really bad negativity that is associated with Twitter, especially with the Black Lives Matter movement and the hyper new wave feminist movement. I actually had to take a step back and I tried to delete my account, but I couldn't figure it out at the time. And I haven't been on about six months. I just don't want to have anything to do with that stuff. But anyways, so yeah, um, that's uh, that's what was going on today. We talked a lot about that. you got to stay theologically sound and to not run after those things. Kind of like that song Vital Lens or um, um, Signs, Symbols and Signs by uh, that band Beautiful Eulogy from Portland. Go ahead and check those guys out. It's pretty cool.
Anyway, so I'm going to go up to the next commercial break, and then after that, we're going to be doing a reading of three different chapters in the book of Discipling. I'm going to tell you why and how important it is, and also important from Pastor Deborah. Let's go ahead and stop, and I'll give you some information on what I like to call reanimator radio. Used to be Metal Blessing Radio, taken from a song from Mortification on one of their new albums, but it's now called Reanimator Radio on Live365.com. And if it's something that you want to listen to when it comes to heavy metal, black metal, death metal, blackened death metal, blackened death thrash metal, thrash punk, like anything of any hard source of metal or heavy metal music that you really are into, but you are just sick of the lyrics of Odin and Thor and all the pagan gods, and you're sick of hearing Satan in the songs and things like that, and you wanted just a daily dose, a daily helping of Jesus and the lyrics, but something that got to get down to, that you want to get down to, ain't corny, go to this radio station alive 365com I use it every other day. I'm always listening to metal music. I'm not into the glam stuff, but everything else, especially the black and death metal. Hey, that's some good stuff, man, the unblack metal. So I would highly suggest you go on Reanded Radio or Radio.com. And here we go, ladies and gentlemen, chapter three, the work of discipling. Discipling does not seem like the most obvious way to establish and strengthen a kingdom. Kingdom building is typically the sort of royal battles, dynamic wars, great fortunes, or works of political philosophy by old men with long gray beards. But Jesus concluded his time on earth commanding his disciples to make disciples. Is that really how his kingdom would be built? In fact, recall what Jesus taught, had taught earlier. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 and 32. Jesus taught his disciples to live in view, not of today or tomorrow, but eternity. We try to help others follow Jesus. We do deliberate spiritual good. We pray for gospel influence. We proclaim God's word. And we do all this for the sake of the last day. Yes, we may see some fruit now. But the goal is to always present people mature in Christ then. Can we say anything further about what discipling is? I've said it's helping others follow Jesus. It's doing them spiritual good. But to fulfill all that out, discipling is initiating a relationship in which you teach, correct, model, and love. It takes great humility and meekness. Initiating. Discipling necessarily involves initiating. It's not passive, and that can feel awkward. You cannot disciple everybody, so you have to pick this person and not that one. Particularly, do your schedules overlap? You also have... Uh, to discern not just who needs help, but who knows they need help and is willing to receive it. In general, you don't want to waste time with people who are not teachable, because you will be wasting time. Look instead for people who, like the wise son in Proverbs, welcomes counsel and instruction. Keep in mind, discipling among gospel believers doesn't mean you, as a discipler, always play the wise one, or that you must be a fount of Socrates-like wisdom with all the answers. Discipling the gospel means that sometimes you lead the way in confessing weakness or sin. By doing so, you demonstrate what it looks like not to find your justification in yourself, but in Christ. And so you live transparently and honestly. Christian discipleship, in other words, isn't just about displaying your strengths. It's, also, it's about displaying your weaknesses, too. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show us that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Still, you initiate in relationship, even if it's they who have asked you to disciple them. You are the one who, to some measure, leads the relationship by deliberately using your time together to point toward the way of Christ. The wife of the non-Christian husband, whom we thought about in chapter 1, does this, if nothing else, by her faithful actions. Outside the church, inside the church. The first stage of discipling can involve establishing a friendship with a non-Christian. You explain the gospel and call him to repentance and faith. 
Once the repentant, once he repents and believes, he should be baptized into church membership. Discipling in the fullest sense, in other words, includes evangelism and conversion. At the same time, if your church is like mine, it regularly receives a gift of new members who are already converted, yet are young in the faith. The Great Commission's command to make disciples through the ministry of the ordinances and teaching oblige us to disciple them, both individually and cooperatively. Together we sit under the preached word and together we enjoy the Lord's Supper to proclaim the Lord's death and to remind one another that we who are many are one body. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. When the church scatters, the ministry of teaching and oversight should continue in the lives of members. This happens over weeknight, desserts, or Saturday morning breakfasts, while folding laundry or taking trips to the grocery store. Discipling lasts all week as members meet to talk, pray, encourage, and insist one another in the fight for love and holiness. Teaching. At its core, discipling is teaching. We teach with words. We teach all the words that Jesus taught his disciples and all the words of the Bible. Corporately, this is why my own church preaches exponentially and consecutively through books of the Bible, alternating between the New and Old Testaments, as well as uh, between big chunks of scripture and little ones. We also encourage people to attend our adult Sunday school program that provides a several year curriculum through different areas of the Christian life. Once people complete the curriculum, we encourage them to walk someone else through the curriculum. Our church also finds lots of ways to promote the ministry of good books. Interpersonally, teaching occurs as people learn to have spiritually meaningful conversations with each other, which is something that I as a pastor encourage for the front almost every from the front almost every week. It's fine to talk about football or the kids' school, but talk about Sunday sermon as well. Ask your friends what God has been teaching you about himself. Small groups can also be useful for facilitating these kinds of relationships. Correcting. Sometimes discipling requires you to warn someone about the choices he or she is making. People grow when you teach them general truths, yes, but also when you correct their particular errors. Part of being a Christian is recognizing that sin deceives us and we need other believers to help us see the things we cannot see in ourselves. Joining a church, I've often said, is like throwing paint on the invisible man. New sins become visible in the course of our discipling relationships. In fact, you can lead in a discipling relationship by inviting others to correct you and making it easy for them to do so. But you must fear God more than man by being willing to correct others when necessary and risk their objection of you for it. Uh, don't agree with that. Ultimately, the work of correction belongs to the whole congregation, which occurs when a member proves more committed to his or her sin than to Christ. After multiple rounds of warning, the person will be excluded from membership and the Lord's table. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. The vast majority of correction in a church, however, should occur in the private context of discipling relationships. Modeling. It's worth noticing that Jesus didn't command his disciples to teach people. He told them to teach people to obey. The goal of discipling is to see lives transformed, which means it involves more than reading a book or even the Bible with another person. Ultimately, Discipling involves living out the whole Christian life before others. Christ is our example here. He left you an example that you should follow. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. We communicate not merely with our words, but by our whole lives. And what happens in a discipling relationship requires more than classroom teaching, like we do every Sunday. It requires the kind of instruction that occurs through an apprenticeship at a job. Or with a personal trainer or coach. An apprentice learns by listening and watching and participating, little by little, with more responsibility being earned over time. Most of all, discipling looks like what God designed for the home, where dads and moms teach in word and deed through all areas of life and then draw the children into work of adulthood. Really, discipling is a kind of fashion modeling, 
No, you're not showing off clothes for a photographer. You're demonstrating a fashion or a way of living for others to follow. Discipling is inviting them to imitate you, making your trust in Christ an example to be followed. It requires you to be willing to be watched and then folding people into your life so that they actually do watch. Each one of the elders in my church, for instance, does exactly this, so that our membership can heed the counsel of Hebrews. Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Chapter 13, verse 7. All of us, in turn, should be able to say to the other Christians in our lives, as Paul did, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Maybe this is why Christian biographies are so useful. Mutual love. To add another angle, discipling is a form of mutual love. There is something of a teacher-student relationship, but there will be also be but there also will be peer-to-peer -peer mutuality and love. Much that the discipling often goes both ways. As one who has been doing this for a long time, I can say that I've often been served and blessed and encouraged in the faith by those whom I am discipling. Even as I work to do them spiritual good, they do me spiritual good. They help me better follow Jesus. Together, we learn that Paul means in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in wisdom. Together, we work to fulfill Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. In discipling, my goal is to love younger Christians by helping them live in light of the final day, but they typically recognize that my ability to do this depends on them helping me to do the same. Humility. There's more I'll say in later chapters about how to do all this, but let me observe for the time being that helping others follow Jesus cannot be done without risk. Just as you have to humble yourself to be discipled, so you have to humble yourself to disciple. Discipling involves difficult things, saying no, preserving through troubles, knowing when to bear with someone, and doing it. Your invitation might be spurn, your counsel rejected. As noted earlier, we disciple not just through our strength, but through our weakness. Christian discipling is not so much the work of experts and technocrats, to borrow the old phrase, it's the work of one beggar pointing another beggar to bread. Aaron Wheeler, wife to Brad, who pastored with me in Washington, D.C., before taking a church elsewhere, reflected in Nine Mark's article how she had to learn these lessons during their time in D.C. Another woman in the church showed up at Aaron's house expecting to be discipled. Aaron welcomed her inside, closed the door behind her, and thought to herself, I am a mess. I have no idea what I'm doing here. There certainly isn't any teaching going on today with my crazy hooligan children and my heart in a bad place toward my husband. I shouldn't be teaching anyone. I'm the one who needs to be discipling. Who needs discipling, I'm sorry. God, what would you have me do? Yet God would soon teach Aaron through situations like these that he would use her weakness as much as her strength. These younger women in the faith needed someone to teach them what it looks like to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, not just in the good times, but in the challenging times. Aaron explained, In discipling these women, I tried to instruct and question them, discuss books together and pray, and they would tell me later that often uh, the best teachings came from simply watching me. They watched God use my weakness in fighting for patience when the day had long since worn me thin. <laughs> They watch me struggle to love my husband after sharing my struggles with the competing demands of ministry. These women got in front row, got a front row seat, she observes, to see the true jar of clay that she is, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. But learning this gospel perspective encouraged her to keep pouring herself out like a drink offering, Philippians chapter 2, verse 17. Knowing that God would use her... Fra um, frailty as a platform 
to display his strength. And sure enough, again and again, God proved faithful to supply everything she needed to love and serve these younger sisters. And she concluded, years later, God brought me a new friend and sister into the church who would come over and hang out on any Saturday afternoon that my husband, as my husband was busy preparing a sermon. Every time she came over, it seemed like something was going wrong. From a fit of rage in one of my children's to the toilet overflowing. It was during one of those times that I looked up at her with a smile, confident in the Lord's perfect timing, and said, You know, God must really love you to let God must really love you to let you see all this. That is our confidence. Not that we have the perfect home and well behaved children, but that in the Merck and Meyer, God's spirit is at work. Even in our weakness, God uses our words to warn those who are idle, encouraging the timid, comfort the weak, and show patience to everyone, all for his great glory. End quote. The local church is the best place for such relationships to grow. As I will observe shortly, a church can be thick with mentoring relationships, even if they are not formally called discipling relationships. After all, discipling really is just a bunch of church meetings taking responsibility to prepare one another for glory, as Aaron and these women did for each other. It's one way to see the New Testament idea that we are a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. How much pastoring gets done in the ordinary life of a congregation when it's characterized by a culture of discipling? One last place humility is required comes with a recognition that people will sometimes move away. The reality of transience, particularly in many cities, requires us to maintain open-handedness toward the people we love. We don't invest and share and pour in and pray and love for what we might receive other than the satisfaction and joy that comes from knowing they are better equipped for, what, for whatever they go do next and ultimately for Christ's coming. Guiding Toward Heaven to be human is to be a disciple. God didn't present Adam and Eve with a choice between discipleship and independence, but between following him and following Satan. We are all disciples, and the only question is of whom? Are we following other believers toward the heavenly city and helping still more to do the same? I love how Charles Spurgeon described his own ministry. In his autobiography, he compares himself to Mr. Greathearted, the character in John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress, who helps others toward the celestial city. I am occupied in my small way, as Mr. Greathearted was employed in Bunyan's day. I do not compare myself with that champion, but I am in the same line of business. I am engaged in personally conducted tours to heaven. Excuse me. It is my business as best I can to kill dragons and cut off giants' heads and lead on, a, and lead on the timid and trembling. I am often afraid of losing some of the weaklings. I am the heartache for them, but by God's grace and your kind and generous help in looking after one another, I hope we shall travel safely to the river's edge. Oh, how many have I have part with there? I have stood on the brink and I have heard them singing in the midst of the stream, and I have almost seen the shining ones led them up the hill and through the gates into the celestial city. End of chapter 3. Chapter 4. Objections to Discipling I realize that I've been using the word discipling where others use different words. In Britain, the phrase reading with seems more common. Here in the States, people prefer to having an accountability partner or prayer partner. Wherever you call it, or whatever you call it, I am using the word as shorthand for helping others follow Jesus by doing deliberate spiritual good in their lives. It involves taking initiative, teaching, modeling, love, and humility. But even if we can't agree on the term, some Christians still have a difficult time with the whole concept of discipling. They feel awkward. They don't want to impose unwanted ideas on others. They don't want to act as if they were above other people. An infinite number of objections can be raised, but let me share with you a few along with my quick response. Objection 1. This discipler is not an ideal. Answer. Neither are you. 
God's the only perfect one in this equation. He gets glory by using imperfect vessels like me and like you. The more humble you are, the more you'll find you have to learn from any other true disciple. Objection number two. If a person is always listening to her discipler, she might no longer submit to other good authorities like parents, husband, or church. Answer, done well. Good discipling will encourage appropriate submission to any authorities established by God. Objection three. This whole thing seems self-centered and prideful. Answer, I understand how it could seem like that, but Christian discipling calls us to follow someone only insofar as he or she follows Christ. It doesn't call us to follow another style or cultural preferences or worldly wisdom or personal habits. Insofar as the practice of discipling calls us to model and imitate Christ for one another, it's really very humbling. Beyond all this, it's simply biblical. Objection four. Isn't it just pushy and aren't you imposing yourself on someone else? Answer. Christian discipling works through a mutual agreement upon relationship. <clears throat> Objection five. I don't need it. I mean, surely the most important things about the Christian life are self-evident. So I'm too busy for this to be a priority. Answer. This sounds like the Lone Ranger Syndrome. Jesus died not for separate individuals, but for a church. By adopting you, God brought you into a family so that you now have your brothers and sisters. What's more, he says we demonstrate our family membership and love for him through our love for one another. We do that through our submission to and fellowship with a local church. Christianity is personal, yes, always, but not private. You need to be involved in the lives of others, and you need to get them in yours. God is the only one who doesn't need to be taught. Objection 6. This is just for extroverts. Answer. No, this is for Christians. The number of these relationships you might have will vary according to personality, life circumstances, and so forth. But having none of them is not an option for faith centered on love and forgiveness. Speak to other mature Christians to help you sort through this in your own life. Objection 7. I can't disciple. I'm imperfect, erring, and too young. Answer. If you are truly following Christ, all you need to do is share what you do know, not what you don't know. For many people around you, that will mean sharing the gospel. With fellow Christian members, this may mean initiating spiritual conversations by asking questions sharing what you've learned, sharing what you're learning and praying for them. Anyone truly following Christ can disciple. Conclusion. Discipling is helping someone follow Jesus by doing deliberate spiritual good in his or her life. We are Christians because someone did that for us and someone did it for them and all the way back to the earliest disciples. The original eyewitnesses of Jesus taught what he had commanded them to and so created ear witnesses this continued down to the present day and now it's our turn under the sovereignty of god the future generations of disciples depends on us following the example of these first disciples discipling is part of our own discipleship to christ but so far i have mostly been encouraging discipling as one-on-one -on -one activity and some of our discipling relationships with other believers may occur outside shared membership in a church. Yet in order for the love of Christ to be displayed clearly to the world around us, see John chapter 13 verses 34 to 35, much of our discipling will occur within the context of the local church. Every Christian needs not just another Christian, each of us needs a whole body. That's what we'll talk about in the next section. And here we go to part two. Where should we disciple? Chapter 5, The Local Church. Dawson Trotman has a remarkable story. In the early 1930s, Trotman, a young lumber yard worker, became inspired by 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. He began teaching high school students to disciple one another and then in 1933 
extended his work to the United States Navy, founding a group called the Navigators. <clears throat> Excuse me. He mentored one sailor who in turn mentored many more on board the USS West Virginia. Before the ship sank at Pearl Harbor, 125 men were growing in Christ and sharing their faith. During World War II, the Navigators Ministry spread to thousands in the United States Navy on ships and bases around the world. The Navigators continued working in the growing military population until 1951, when it also began to work with college students on the campus of the University of Nebraska. Trotman died in 1956, rescuing a young girl from drowning in upstate New York, but the work went on. Today, hundreds of college campuses around the world have a Navigators group evangelizing and discipling students. The Navigators website describes the organization as a Christian ministry that helps people grow in Jesus Christ as they navigate through life. They also say, we spread the good news of Jesus Christ by establishing life on life mentoring or discipling, relationships with people, equipping them to make an impact on those around them for God's glory. I am thankful for their ministry, especially in this area of discipling. But what about the church? Having said that, it is interesting that these two summary statements describe what churches should be doing. Some people raise concerns about parachurch ministries like the navigators replacing the church. Para means beside, and it's worth asking whether these parachurch ministries really work beside churches or apart from them. Certainly there are some circumstances, such as sailors on a battleship in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, that require discipling apart from the local church. It would be tragically wrong, however, to use something like a campus ministry or a businessman's fellowship to replace the local church when it comes to making and growing disciples, as if you were trapped on a ship at sea. If it's unwise to do discipling without a church, it's worse to do a church without discipling. Yet, isn't that the case with many local churches? Christians join churches and no one comes alongside them. There was no cultural or, sin or single folks living with families to learn how to serve Christ. No culture of sharing the gospel with international students. Little hospitality, only occasional invitations to Sunday lunch or Thursday night dinner. No men sheep herding their wives and no wives or older women um, generally discipling younger women. No biblical counseling among the members themselves, counseling occurs only in offices. No thought of going to a church where the style of music may not be your favorite, even though it serves others. No thought of helping a family or marriage in trouble. Little reaching out to people with a different skin color or accent. Few, if any, young men meeting up with other young men to study scripture. With churches like this, it's not surprising that some have turned to parachurch ministries. Their experience has taught them to the local church is the last place to look for discipling opportunities. The church itself as the discipler. Yet the Bible teaches that the local church is the natural environment for discipling. In fact, it teaches the local church is itself the basic discipler of Christians. It does this through its weekly gatherings and its accountability structures this chapter, as well as its elders and its members, next chapter. These in turn provide the context for the one-on-one -on -one discipling we have been considering so far. The gathered local church is responsible to preach the whole counsel of God through those gifted for his purpose. Through baptism it affirms credible professions. Through the Lord's Supper it declares the Lord's death and makes many into one. And though excommunication it removes anyone whose life unrepentantly contradicts his or her profession. That much provides a church's skeletal structure. Then we come to the realm of relationships, which are like the church's flesh and muscle. In their life together, the members of a church practice loving one another as Jesus had loved them. A new commandment I give to you, 
that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Excuse me. John chapter 13 verse 34 and 35. With what kind of love did Jesus love his disciples? He loved them with a love that continually pointed to the words of the Father, that demonstrated his love through obeying the Father, that accursed them of a place, assured them, I'm sorry, that assured them of a place being prepared for them, that ultimately laid down his life so that they could be forgiven. Now think, where can we too best love like this? Answer, in an environment where we can love by pointing to the words of the Father and Son, by affirming repentance through baptism, by affirming that many are one through the supper, and by sacrificing our own agendas and vendettas through forgiveness. Flesh and skeleton come together. In these most basic ways, the local church is the primary discipler of all Christians. Our churches will never be perfect, but if heaven is what Jonathan Edwards called a world of love, as in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 implies, then a local church should be a preview or foretaste of that world. Gathering together. The church's discipling work begins quite simply by gathering together. The author of Hebrews writes, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet each other, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawn, drawing near. Chapter 10, verse 24 through 25. Notice that the goal here is to help one another follow Jesus, or as Hebrews put it, stir one another up to love and good works. And how does the author say a church accomplishes that goal? By not neglecting meeting together, by gathering. This is how we encourage one another. He meets for us to repeatedly and regularly gather, and that regular meeting gives shape to following Jesus and helping others follow Jesus. An authority structure. This was Jesus' own design. Jesus had been discipling the twelve for some time when he asked them who he was. Peter professed that Jesus was the long-promised Messiah. Jesus affirms Peter's answer on behalf of the Father who is in heaven. And he promises to build his church on his rightly professing Peter. Excuse me. Then, interestingly, Jesus begins to put an authority structure in place. He gives Peter the authority to do what Jesus had done with him, to bind and loose on earth what's bound and loosed in heaven. That is to say, Peter and the apostles would be able to hear pe people's confessions and then affirm or deny those confessions and confessors on behalf of heaven like Jesus had done with Peter. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 through 20. Later, Jesus then puts his same authority into the hands of the local church, envisioning a situation in which a man's profession of faith contradicts his life. Jesus gives the gathered church the authority to bind and loose. The church would need to judge whether to continue affirming someone's profession or to exclude the individual form, or it, I'm sorry, exclude the individual from membership. See Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 through 20. In short, the gathered assembly possesses the authority to affirm or disaffirm who belongs to the body of Christ or who is a disciple. And in so doing, it provides the context of accountability for discipling. Is this person I'm discipling an unbeliever? A believer, someone who needs to be told he is living like an unbeliever. Baptizing and teaching one another. How exactly does a church affirm who the disciples are? Though baptism and the, through baptism and the Lord's Supper, after invoking all authority in heaven and on earth, Jesus commands his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them. To baptize someone is to formally recognize he is with Jesus. These Jesus representatives must then be taught, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. And through the Lord's Supper, Paul says, we who are many are one body, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 17. 
Moving into the book of Acts and the epistles, we find the apostles' discipling program. They're not just freely roving disciples among unaffiliated groups of people. Rather, they baptize people into the churches, where any one-on-one -on -one discipling and fellowship would then occur. So Peter preaches the gospel at Pentecost. People repent and get baptized. The people gather regularly, both in homes and in the temple courts, for the breaking of bread. And all this adds up to a church, the church in Jerusalem. The disciples then spread out to the nations and make disciples not apart from baptism, baptizing and teaching, or apart from the Lord's Supper, or apart from teaching, teachers gifted by God. No, the disciples plant churches that obey and teach others to obey. In the New Testament, the local church is at the very center of the disciples' obedience and discipling work. It's not optional, it's basic. We'll think about this further in the next chapter, particularly in terms of the elders' and members' work. And for chapter 6, we're going to leave that for next week's show. Thank you, one and all, for listening and subscribing to this Death Church podcast, where we do nothing but talk about Jesus in the Bible, but we want to treat it as also a podcast where it's a little bit laid back, but you still get everything that you would need from any time you would like to spend time with God. Go ahead and share this with your friends. Tell your friends about this. If you want to come on the show, the link is in the description for the uh, Facebook account and the email address. Thank you once again for listening. And we'll be back next week to do another three chapters or 25-something pages. And it's going to be the second to last episode for the series of The Discipleship.